Welcome back guys. Today we will check the advent of Cyber 2024 hosted on TryHackMe platform. Today I will be providing the walkthrough for day 5 which is about learning about XML and XML external entity injection vulnerability. You can visit my blog post to check out the walkthrough and answers of the previous days in addition to the upcoming days. Let's get started. Okay, the first thing I want to talk about here is what is XML? XML is an extensible markup language and this language is just used to um, store and transport data in a structured format that can be understood by machines and humans. For example, take a look at this. Uh, this piece of text here, it has the tags that's used in the XML language. For example, name, address, email, phone are tags. These tags are used to store the data. For example, the name tag stores the name, which is a glitch. Address is the tag that stores information about the address. So the first thing we want to remember about XML is the elements or the tags that store the actual data being transported. The next thing we have is the document type definition. In document type definition or DTD, we define the structure of the uh, data. T take an example. The doc type here is people and it has an element. The element here defines what is allowed in the XML uh, text here. For example, here we have name, address, email, phone. These are the tags that are allowed. Okay. And then we have PC data. It stands for parsed people data. So here it means that these tags or elements will just consist of plain text. So, so far, so forth, we have the definition of XML and we have the document type definition. Next, we move on to entities. In entities, we can reference external or internal data from within the web application or from outside the web application, outside the machine that hosts the application. For example, how do we know that there is an entity being processed? We look at the XML here and we see that there is an entity. And entity name is ext or exit. or, And then we have the reference. For example, the ext element here, the ext entity here tries to load the robots .txt file located uh, in TryHackMe website. So that's what our entity is for. Now, let's move on to XML external entity. The main objective of this challenge here is to uh, demonstrate the XML external entity attack. It's where an attacker can load entities of their own choice. So here, an attacker would be able to load entities that references or the reference uh, sensitive files on the system. For example, the entity here tries to load the entity's name here is THM file. And using the system, it tries to load a file, a sensitive file that contains supposedly information about the users in a Linux system. So in an XML external entity injection attack, what the attacker does, that's what the attacker does. It, they try to load sensitive files from within the server or tries to load external files that are stored on their servers, maybe to execute uh, malicious code inside the attacker, inside the victim machine. Now, if you move on and deploy the machine here, so make sure to deploy the machine and access the uh, the URL. Now, before I do anything else, I just started Purpose Suite from here. And once you start Purpose Suite, go to Proxy and highlight Proxy Settings. Click on Proxy Settings, then click on Perps Browser. In Perps Browser, make sure to check the Allow Perps Browser to run without a sandbox. This will allow you to run the Perp Suite built-in browser to process the requests sent to the server. So once we do that, we click on X and then we move on to the browser and access the page. Okay, so that's what the page looks like. Now here, the challenge, uh, we have to follow the challenge and make some interaction with the site. For example, something you can do is try to view the products. And here we have requests sent to Perp. I'm going to uh, examine the request and I click on forward. Now, temporarily, I'm going to disable the intercept so that all the requests are forwarded without any uh, interception from uh, my side. So I'm going to click on this product. So you can view this product, the name of the product, and description about the product. We go back and view the other product, tell you of the file. And the last product is the cane here. So that's all of the products displayed on the page. The next thing you want to do here is to choose a product from the displayed products and add it to the wishlist. So we click on view 
And here, as you can see, we only have add to wishlist. Usually there are other buttons displayed beside such products in an e-commerce site, such as checkout or add to cart. We're going to add this to the wishlist. As you can see, the item added to your wishlist successfully. If I go to my cart, I can see there is one item in my shopping cart. This is the item that I added previously. Now, assuming I want to buy this product, I'm going to proceed to checkout. And here I can enter my name, let's say um, Santa Close, and the address, complete checkout. All right, so here the wish has been saved in the wish lists. Now, the item that I have stored or I have selected was stored in wish number 21. Okay, now you haven't bought the product but you have just added the product to the wish list so that once the product is released into the market, you will be able to uh, buy it or be notified that you can buy now, now buy the product and check out online. Okay, now let's examine the wish here, number 21, which supposedly is the wish containing the product that I have selected. Click on wish number 21, but we receive an error. Santa's elves are the only ones who can read wishes. Looks like this is a page that we are not authorized to read. We examine the URL here, we see it is slash wishes slash wish number 21. So because there is number here 21 referencing the number of the wish, we automatically assume that there might be other wishes placed uh, before our wish, right? Wish number 20, wish number 19, and there are other wishes. The objective of the challenge here is to be able to view all these wishes. How are we gonna do that? We're gonna leverage XML external entity injection. Now we have browsed through the site, let's go back to perp and examine the... So here we can see all the requests that we have sent to the web server, including the requests that we have sent to the forbidden page. It is slash wishes slash wish 22. Now, if we examine, if you go back to the uh, room here or the challenge, once we arrive here, as you can see, we have to examine the wish list page. We go to the wish list page and see here, when we added the product to our wish list, we actually, what we did, we sent a post request to slash wishlist.php. Accompanied with the request is the XML we see here. That's the XML that has been sent. So the request does use XML to add the products to the wishlist. Here, that's the XML we have. And here we have the uh, product user ID and the product ID. Okay. Once we see that, that the application uses an XML, there's a, an opportunity here to take advantage of XML external entity injection. We're going to just try and load a file internally from within the system. If you go back here, this is the code of the wishlist page. As you can see on this line, there is library XML disabled entity loader false. This means that the backend application, right, that's written by the developer allows us to use or allows us to use external entities because it sets the value of this to false. If you want to prevent uh, loading external entities, all you have to do is to go back to the application and put this to true. Once this is set to false, we can now load external entities. Now, simple XML or strings allow us to load the XML data with the option lib XML no end. So that's the payload given here, given to us. If we copy this and go back here, what you can do here, you can right click and send to repeater. Repeater is a feature in purpose that allows you to play with the application, right? And examine the, or monitor the response, the behavior of the app. Go back to repeater, and here we're gonna just play with this. Uh, copy the XML here, and paste it here, instead of this one. All right, so what happened? Here we have actually defined the doc type, and then we defined an external entity. The entity name is payload. And the payload tries to load the contents of the ETC host file or the host file on the uh, system that hosts the UI application. So the user ID is fine, but the product ID, instead of loading the product ID, we are actually referencing the name of the entity. What happens when we reference the name of the entity here, we are actually displaying the contents that was stored or retrieved from the uh, host file. If we send this, we can see the contents of the host file uh, have been retrieved and now we are able to uh, exploit this vulnerability. Now you can change this to maybe etc password 
and try to load the contents of the password file. Here you'll be able to examine all the users on the system. That's perfect. Now we know that the application is vulnerable to XML external entity injection. What's the next step? The next step is to circle back to our objective. The objective of this engagement is to view all the wishes placed by other users. Remember from before that <coughs> that's our wish. Now we want to examine the other wishes. What do we do? We, we want to go back to Verb Suite and find in the uh, proxy tab, go to proxy his the HTTP history and find this request. That's the request that we made, right? To in attempting to retrieve the contents of our wish. I know it was 21 and now it's 22. I made another request because the first one was just uh, an attempt I made for the first time. Now my wish is number 22. I want to access that wish. How do, how do we do that? We use the XML external entity. But there is one catch here. The catch is I don't know the path, the actual path on the victim system that stores the wish file. All I know is the URL slash wishes slash wish. How do I guess the path? Remember that in most web servers operated on a Linux system, they are stored under var slash www slash html. Most of the Apache web servers and some Nginx web servers, the location of the complete directory that stores the website files is under www.var.html. That's fine. Now we have a, uh, let me call it um, a guess or an initial value of the directory that might store the uh, file. So what we do next, we try to assume that after HTML, we have slash uh, wishes, slash wish, and the number of wish. Let's see that in action. We go back to the repeater and we try to load this path. So we have var .html slash wishes wish number 22 that's my wish let's make sure that path is correct so wishes that's right and wish number 22 underscore 22 yeah send this fail to parse the xml because we have an issue here it's the typo instead of n we're gonna have to put m and now we are able to load the wish number 22 see here the product id is wish number 22 the name that i have written and the address that I have selected. That's the product I have added. And that's another one that I've added before. Let's start to access wish number one. That's a wish that is not ours. We sent and now we are able to access wish number one. Who placed the wish? It's mayor malware and the address is test. And that's the product they selected. Wish number two. And now you're able to see wish number two. Now scrolling down, we want to solve the challenge now. What is the flag discovered after navigating through the wishes? Okay, remember that the total number of wishes is 22, right? We were the last ones to put a wish. So the last one or the last number is 22. So we have to start from one incrementing till we reach 22. We can do that. Once you reach wish number 15 sent, you will see that it is the flag. Now you might be asking me, how do you know it's 15? Remember that you have to, I started this before. I tried one, two, three, four, five, and now I'm just giving it to you to you on a server plate without uh, just trying to att attempting to load them one by one and wasting the time. So it's wish number 15 that will give you the flag. And the next thing, what is the flag seen on the possible proof of sabotage? Proof of sabotage here. In order to extract proof of that someone did something, we have to look through the logs. And uh, let's see where we can, we want to see the logs here. Let's go back and go to proxy. So if there is a, a page that allows us to view maybe the, uh, the logs or the changes made. Now it's not clear here. That's why you have to go back to the challenge page and check out the description here. In the walkthrough, there is a mention of a page named uh, change log. So after discovering the vulnerability, max it immediately. Remember that a change log file exists within the application stored at the following endpoint. After checking, it can be seen that someone push the vulnerable code within the application after a software team. That's change log that the developers uh, team uses to track the changes. Very much similar to the uh, GitHub commit changes. So we're going to just try to load this file from uh, burp, maybe inside burp. Yeah, go back to intercept and open the browser. OK, let's copy this. Uh, examine perp. We're going to forward this let's have a look now okay now we can see the changes every change has a commit the author and the date 
Take a look at this change, the last one, made by Mayor Malware, and we can see the flag is written here. And that was it. That was day five of Advent of Cyber.